All right. Good afternoon, everyone. It is 5.01, so we are going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Melanie. I will be one of your hosts behind the scenes for our webinar today. And I'm just going to cover a few housekeeping items with everyone. Para acceder a la interpretación, bienvenidos. Para escuchar la interpretación del inglés al español, favor de hacer clic en el globo que aparece a mano derecha. Luego hagan clic en español para escuchar la interpretación. La interpretación no está disponible para las personas que llamen usando la línea de conferencia. Si usted llamó desde su teléfono, por favor cuelgue la llamada y entre usando una computadora o la aplicación móvil de Zoom desde su aparato. Si estás llamando desde la aplicación de Zoom en tu celular, haz clic en los tres puntos, luego la interpretación de idiomas, luego español y finalizado. Okay, so before we get started, um, just wanted to let you all know that um, due to the, the size of our audience today, we have muted everyone just to make for the best experience. So we do ask that if you have questions that you use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. I'll show you a screenshot in just a moment. Uh, if time allows at the end of the webinar, we will pause for additional questions. Um, we will ask participants to raise your hand using the raise hand option, uh, and we will allow you to unmute yourself to ask questions live. Um, but the easiest way to submit a question is to use the Q&A function if you're able. Uh, a link to the Q&A will be shared later with all of the participants in addition to a recorded version of this webinar, and we will share that with you at a later date. All right, so for the Q&A, there is an icon at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A. So if you click that, and then you just type your question into the box and click send. And we will do our best to answer questions as we go today. Um, but as I said, we will send out Q&A uh, at a later time as well to get you all the answers. All right, so I am going to go ahead and pass it on to Melanie Bush. Thank you, Melanie. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Melanie Bush, and I am Deputy Director, um, Deputy Medicaid Director here at North Carolina Medicaid. I would like to welcome you all for joining us today. The purpose of today's webinar is to give you, our community partners, a demonstration of the ePass portal where individuals can apply for Medicaid. This demonstration is meant to help you understand how to navigate ePass, provide some tips for applicants as they answer questions on the application. And at the end of the demo, we hope you will have a better understanding so that you can provide navigational assistance to people who are interested in applying for benefits without having to go through their local DSS. This is not a training, it's a demonstration. So we will not be discussing the specifics of Medicaid eligibility. Questions related to eligibility should always be handled by our local DSS offices. We also want you to understand that while we encourage applicants to answer every question that is asked on the ePass application so that it is processed more quickly, it is not required. Applications may be submitted with minimal information and a caseworker can follow up to request additional information if it's needed. We are recording today's webinar so that it may be viewed at a later date for those who are unable to attend this live session. Thank you again for joining and we hope that you find this very helpful. Good afternoon. My name is Wes Wollstone Hume and I'm a business analyst and user experience designer uh, for ePass. And today my role will be able to, to walk uh, through several areas and functionality of ePass including creating an account and submitting an example application. At the end of that application, we'll also go over the enhanced functions of ePass, 
additional features other than just submitting an application, such as recertifying for benefits or reporting a change. Uh, for the purposes of today's demo, we will walk through an application for medical assistance or Medicaid. Uh, but it's important to note that uh, much of what we discuss is applicable for uh, food assistance, energy assistance, and TANF or work first. Uh, as mentioned, we have the audience muted today to allow for the best experience and for our recording. Uh, please feel free to use the chat function to ask questions. And we'll also allow for time at the end of the webinar for participants to continue with those questions. And now I'll turn the time over to Liz. Thanks, Wes. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining. My name's Liz O'Dell, and I'm a Medicaid Operational Support Team Program Representative with North Carolina Medicaid Member Operations. And today, as Wes walks us through the EPASS application, my role will be to provide some additional information about some of the questions that are being asked in the application, what they mean, and why they are important. Before we get started, we want to make again, make sure that everyone understands how important it is to never discourage anyone from making a Medicaid application. Today, we're offering tips that may help people avoid having to provide additional information after they've submitted their application or avoid the delays in having their application processed. But remember that anyone can apply at any time and minimal information is needed to submit your application for benefits. Please understand that the names and the personal information that we're using today are not real. The scenario, people, and information we are using today are for demonstration purposes only. In this scenario, Jennifer Smith is applying for Medicaid for herself and her husband, Fernando Garcia Lopez. Their child, Jesse Garcia Lopez, is already receiving Medicaid. The names, demographics, and personal information you will see Wes entered today in the EPASS application are not based on any real individual or real information. And without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Wes, I'll pass it back to you. Great, thanks, Liz. Okay, let's see, I think I chose the wrong screen, hold on. Okay, we should be seeing uh, the landing page of ePass. Um, we'll be going over uh, the ePass site today. This is what it looks like when you land on there at epass.nc.gov. Uh, we'll go be going over this. For those, um, if you have a device, there's a QR code you can scan with your uh, mobile, the camera on your mobile device. Uh, and uh, our ePass site is uh, reactive, meaning it will change to whatever size of device you're using. So it's mobile friendly and will size accordingly. For our demo today, we'll be viewing it in a desktop mode. Um, but uh, first off, just looking at it, uh, you know, I haven't logged in yet. I'm just kind of seeing what there's here to do. I can apply for benefits. Uh, which includes medical assistance, food nutrition services, cash or energy. I can apply for uh, FNS and energy without creating an account. I can enhance my account, which we'll go over a little bit later. And then learn more kind of gives, uh, there's a, an embedded video here to be able to watch about how to uh, create an account and apply through ePass as well as well as uh, program information for each of those programs listed that actually takes the user outside of ePass over to the DHHS website for those details. Um, we support English and Spanish. So if I hit the uh, Spanish locale button here, all the text, including the application, uh, will change to Spanish text. And at the footer also, uh, there's the ability to go back between English and Spanish if needed. Okay, um, for part of our demo today, once we're done here, we're actually going to be going in to submit this application and we're going to be doing it in a test environment on a virtual machine and on a virtual meeting. So there may be some lag between screens. Um, hopefully we don't have any technical issues. Uh, but just wanted to uh, state that as well. 
in order to um, apply for medical assistance, the individual needs to have uh, an e-pass account. And so if they click apply or sign up, it's going to take them to that to log in or to sign up. And coming here, in order to create an e-pass account, they have to create an NCID or North Carolina Identity Management uh, ID that's uh, managed by the North Carolina Department of uh, Information Technology. Um, the DHHS agency does not own that site, but it's a, a way to create an account that we are required to use. And so we'll be going over that today. Uh, for most of our people on this webinar, your community-based organizations, community partners, assisting people with applying uh, for benefits. And so the idea here is to please select what kind of NCID account you need to create. Um, if you're assisting with somebody, uh, they're sitting next to you and you're applying, the idea is you'll be creating an individual NCID for them. That way it's their account and then they can come back in at a later time and manage that case. You are not manage it, managing it for them. You are rather just assisting them in the application process. Also on this screen, there's a, a click here if there's more information needed uh, regarding applying on behalf of someone else. There's great details here. I think we'll send this link out at the end. But again, if you're assisting an individual, you're going to help them create their own individual NCID account. Now, as part of this, we're going to go through this account creation. Um, this recently changed over the weekend. Hopefully this loads right here. I did a video recording of it because it uh, requires a separate email every time and I don't have the ability to just and time to create a bunch of emails. So we're gonna go ahead and play this video and I'll talk through it. So again, they're gonna, you're gonna select that they're applying for themselves or that you are gonna assist them in applying uh, with that application process. And then by selecting that radio button and clicking create NCID, it gives you, um, let me go back a second. It gives you this um, redirect uh, modal that pops up that basically says you are going to be redirected to the North Carolina Identity Management System. And you can see I have one browser tab open here. When I hit continue, it's going to open up a separate browser tab that is where that creation will take place. Once you have created the account, with the individual, then you'll go want to go back to this redirect tab, or this tab that's open on the far left, as that is where they will ultimately log in. And we'll be able to see that as we complete this process, but I just wanted to note that here. And so it's taken me to um, register user for NCID. Uh, this is brand new screens that came out over the weekend, so they look a little bit different than they did last week but they'll need to create a username for themselves. And something that they can remember, you'll want to have them write it down as well, because they will need to remember the username and the password to log in. Um, and as part of this also, they will need to have an email address. NCID requires an email address to complete the NCID account creation. So we'll go ahead and just play this. So I'll put in a, a username here. I'm applying for Jennifer Smith. So I'll just create one that's similar to her name, put in her first name and last name. And then this is where I put in the email address, and it requires me to enter it twice um, just to verify that is correct. So I enter it in twice. Uh, we also, you know, encourage them to put in a mobile number. That is where in case um, they got locked out of their NCID account, uh, they could re receive a text message with a security code to uh, unlock that account. 
then they need to put in the password um, and it needs to have like eight, at least eight characters, uppercase, lowercase, special characters. And those are all defined below. When I've met the qualifications of the password, then the save button becomes active. And then we can hit save. We can see that all green marks are checked. Hit save. It's going to confirm the registration. So I'll go ahead and confirm that. that. Yes, that's correct. That's what I want to do. And then it's going to send an email um, to the email address that I entered. So you'll need to help them in their email. Go pull it up. We'll pull it up here. And again, this is a different browser. You'll see. Aside from the one I have open where I'm doing account creation for NCID and then my ePass one. Now I'm going into my email and I can see I have one here from the new NCID user verif verification. And it used to be a code uh, that you would enter. Now it's a link that you click and select to complete the application process. Okay, and then uh, it did say that it was completed. Now I would log in to NCID. I have to finish that login to NCID to make that account active. So I'll log in with the username and password that was just created. And then here on the screen, it will give me a confirmation that now my NCID account is active. You can see that it has active status. And from here, uh, I'll be closing this out and going back over to this tab to then actually log in to ePass with that same username and password. Okay, now once I've logged in, I no longer am on the home page or the landing page. I'm on my dashboard. And then this is where I can now, you can see you have a, a button here to apply for benefits. Um, now we're going to go out of this video. That's all we needed to show on the NCID account creation and ePass account creation. And we will go to our test environment. Uh, we're much like I did there. We'll go ahead and log in. This will be a different uh, username and password that I just created because uh, it's a test environment region. But it will still be for our application will still be for Jennifer Smith. I'll log in. Best environment takes a little bit slower. Uh, but again, it will, instead of being on the ePass homepage, it'll then uh, kick me to uh, my user account dashboard. Okay. Uh, where I, home is, is going back to the uh, homepage. Uh, your account is where you have your, your dashboard. And this is where you can apply. Um, the enhanced account features, we will go over these in further detail. Or more than just submitting an application, I can receive um, electronic uh, versions of notices. Instead of getting them in the mail, they can come here. I get a text 
that says uh, you have a new, a new message. Well, it's actually this one. You have a new communication. And then they would see that they could log in and view that communication. They can report changes. And they can renew for medical assistance benefits, the ability to renew or recertify for FNS or SNAP benefits will also be coming uh, at the end of the year. Um, they can upload documents. I guess here it is renew, SNAP, renew for FNS. Uh, those will be coming in out, you know, in the real live e-pass here at the end of the year, and they can appeal a Medicaid decision. They can also receive secure messages from their caseworker. Uh, basically real-time information that says, hey, I need your two pay stubs for these dates. Please send them to me. And the person would get a text message that says, hey, uh, you received uh, a new message from your caseworker. Log in to view it, and we'll show that as well. well let's go ahead and move on to the apply. So we're going to apply for benefits. And our application that we're going to go through today, while it's only for medical assistance, within that application, that same application, I can apply for food nutrition services and uh, TANF or work first. It's kind of like a um, automatic transmission where based upon what I select, it'll either include questions or exclude questions that are pertinent or applicable to those different uh, and various programs. So now we're on the getting started page, basically that, you know, we define what a medical assistance family is, um, uh, what a nutrition household is, and a workforce household. We'll refer back to these later on, so we don't have to memorize them here. And then we get into the realm of uh, who am I applying for, myself and my family or household as a representative or an authorized representative. Um, an authorized representative is really someone that has um, basically filled out a form, especially for medical assistance, to act in behalf of uh, and receive information on and make decisions for a case. Uh, Liz can go into that further. Um, for our situation, we're really just going to say we're applying for myself and my family. And that's where if you are assisting them uh, and they're sitting there by you, that's what you would be doing unless you are that designated authorized representative. Liz, you want to go over that a little bit? Yeah, thanks, Wes. Um, an authorized representative could be a power of attorney or someone who has guardianship over another person. And so you there would be a formal legal document that designates a person as that power of attorney or guardianship. And so then they could, they're their authorized representative to be able to submit an application without that person present. So they could create an application and submit it uh, for them. If for Medicaid purposes, if you're not a power of attorney, if you're not a guardianship, the applicant can designate someone to act on their behalf as an authorized representative. And we do have a form that's available on the North Carolina Medicaid, the NC Medicaid website, where you go to the area that tells you all about applying for Medicaid. There's a list of forms. It's a DHB 5202C, but it's, it's labeled as a um, authorized representative designation form. But that would be needed if someone would like you to act on their behalf and submit the application on their behalf. But as Wes mentioned, if you're just assisting someone walking through the e-pass application, or if you're just sitting with them, helping them work through that, you do not have to be designated as an authorized representative. Thanks, Liz. We know there's a lot of questions around this, and I think we'll be following up with some information uh, in the next week or so. Uh, we're going to go ahead and say we're not applying for FNS. We're not applying for TANF. We're only doing a medical assistance application. And then this is where it's trying to determine, well, is it a household that is based upon the Affordable Care Act? Or does it include members based upon traditional Medicaid that would, might be aged, blind, or disabled? For ours, we're going to say nobody's blind, nobody's disabled. Nobody needs help with daily living activities. Um, within this, 
you'll see there's some uh, little question icons. Those can, those can be clicked, and there's more information that's given out about that question. Uh, for this one, you know, somebody that needs help with daily living activities, that's not a baby, that's not a young child, that's kind of a, a you know, an adult that basically is living in a nursing home or other medical facility and needs uh, assistance with showering, dressing, getting in and out of bed, uh, toileting, eating, and all those various things. Uh, we don't have anybody in our household that fits that, nor anybody that's age 65 and older. And then these can be selected to just close them back down. We'll hit next. Um, what you need to know here, the main thing is if they are idle for more than 30 minutes, their session will time out. But whatever they've entered up at that point, if they've logged in and created an account, that information will be saved and they can come back and resume that application at a later time. Um, and then we have large pieces of text that we don't want to overwhelm them, especially on a mobile device. So we put in them in what we call accordions and these can be clicked to just uh, view more details regarding those uh, policies or areas of information. Uh, voter registration, they can indicate that they want to receive information and a registration card. So we'll just pass that. And now we're on our kind of uh, second section header about you. This is the person that's the main person applying. Uh, these are some of the details we want to know, uh, why we need to know them so we can verify identity, income, and citizenship, and how they should respond if they don't know the answer. You know, use your best in information that you have at the time. We'll go ahead and hit next. And then we're going to enter information about this primary person, which is Jennifer. And this one is Smith. And on this one, um, Jennifer was just recently married to Fernando, um, but she hasn't changed her name legally yet. She intends to, but for right now, she needs to enter her legal name, which is her maiden name. Um, and that way, when we try to electronically verify the information regarding her income, her citizenship, uh, we will get back positive responses versus not getting back information because the name was wrong. Uh, we'll enter her um, date of birth here. Now. And do you want to apply for medical assistance? So we want to make sure that uh, yes to this question is answered for each person uh, that is applying for Medicaid. There may be individuals in the household that are not applying or that are already receiving. They still need to be entered so that we create the correct household size um, to determine benefits. But uh, we also want to know which of those individuals are or applying. Um, and if Wes, if I could just jump in really yes. quickly, I want everyone to be aware that if you submit a Medicaid application, you're submitting for all Medicaid programs. There's a lot of different Medicaid programs. You don't have to specify a particular program. Your, your, all the information that you provide is taken and evaluated to determine which program is best for you. Great, thank you. Uh, now they would enter their address if they don't have one. Um, then they would, like if they're homeless, then they can just say what county they're going to be living in. And then we would use that county DSS office um, as their address to mail information to them. We're going to go ahead and say we do have an address. So I'll enter those details. And then if the mailing address is the same or different, we're going to say it's the same. If it was different, they could put in a different mailing address. And then contact information, uh, you know, what language they want to speak in. Again, these aren't required fields. We're not going to go through every one of them. They can put in their phone number. And if it's mobile or cell number, then we'll ask them if they want to receive those text messages. Like we talked about the secure messages that come uh, through ePass to notify them of uh, information that they need to uh, provide. 
uh, we'll go ahead and say yes. They can also sign up for DHHS alerts, which is more like um, not specific to their case or eligibility or, or more like, hey, open enrollment begins on this date or uh, COVID testing is available here, kind of more um, campaign or um, broadcast to uh, a general body of people. Okay, we put in an address. And so what it's gonna do now is it's gonna return. And if I put in an address that matches something known to the post office, it's gonna come back with we suggest and that in all caps and it pre-selected. If it didn't find an address that was known by the postal service, it wouldn't have that line here. It would just be you entered and they would select that and move forward. We want the cleansed address, that's what we call it. Um, Go ahead and select that. And because we've entered Jennifer's name and her date of birth, uh, now we'll, we know, you know we're gonna have questions specific to her. We also show the age by the individual. That way, if I've entered, if there's two Jennifers in the household, we can distinguish them uh, by the age next to their name. Uh, so for Jennifer, we're gonna say she's not Hispanic or Latino and that she's white or Caucasian. If they're part of a federally recognized tribe, they would need to indicate that also they're American Indian, Alaska native. Um, and by checking that as yes, then we get the questions on if they're a federally recognized tribe member, they can say yes, they can say what state. On all of the state drop down fields, North Carolina is at the top. Uh, so they can select that and then they can see that there's the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians and they chose a different state, Alabama, it would contain those tribes that are federally recognized for that state. Uh, for us, we're just going to say they're not uh, American Indian or Alaskan Native. And Wes, I just would like to jump in and add, and while that's so very important, that knowing that someone is a member of a federally recognized tribe possibly determines that they're eligible for the tribal option, but also there's um, some information that's related to co-pays for their Medicaid eligibility. So it's very important to have that information as well. Thank you. Great. Uh, Jennifer does have an SSN. We'll go ahead and enter it there. And it is the same name. Uh, Jennifer Smith, if there's a name that appears on her card, yes, if she, for whatever reason it was not, she could put in the name. Uh, so again, that we interface correctly with the Social Security Administration or say it's the same. And next. Okay, so now we've entered our main person that's applying or our main household member. And now we need to enter the other household members, right? And the details for them. And we'll go ahead and hit yes or hit next. And then we get to kind of what we talked about early. Well, who is in my household? Who should I include? And again, this is where we have the accordions. Well, for medical assistance, it should include these individuals. For food nutrition services, it's here. And then we also have one that says, who should I not include? So they should be able to look at that and determine, do I have more people to add? And based upon that, is there anyone else to add? We're going to say yes. And my household so far is Jennifer, age 33, will now enter her husband, um, Fernando. And Fernando um, has two um, surnames, a paternal and a maternal surname. Uh, uh, and so, we want to gather both of those names. And in doing so, the way we need it to be spelled so that we match correctly when it gets submitted is we would put both of those names in and we would take out any space or dash and then capitalize that second name, right? So it's Garcia, Lopez. I can see that there's another capital there to distinguish that second name. So that's how we ask that you help them enter their last name if they used two uh, surnames. 
And we'll go ahead and enter the date of birth for Fernando. And yes, he does want to apply for medical assistance. So more about Fernando. Uh, he, he, he is Hispanic, Latino, and also white Caucasian is what he indicates his race to be. He does not have an SSN, uh, but he has applied for one. Okay. We've added in Fernando. We have Jennifer, and we go back to the same page. Every time we add somebody in, we're going to go back to the same page to be able to take reference, you know. You've added the people above. Take a look and decide if you need to add more people. Again, who should I add? Okay, it's right there, the same reference. So I don't forget or have to, I don't have to memorize that. And we do have one other person to put in, uh, their child. Uh, we're going to put in Jesse. And he also goes by uh, Garcia Lopez as well. So we'll put in the same spelling of those two surnames. He was just born earlier this year. And he is not applying for medical assistance. He already is receiving based upon a, a prenatal program or whatever else that Jennifer was applying for at the time. Uh, we're going to go ahead and complete that part for him. And now we need the other information about Jesse. Um, we ask middle information for him because he's not applying. We'll go ahead and put in his social security number. Okay, now we have all three here. Again, take a look. Are we done? We have the age, the age by each one. So if we had two Fernandos, we could distinguish. That, okay, I do have both Fernandos here. And at this point, we're done adding people. So we're going to say no. OK, now we need to define the relationships for each person entered between each other. And so we have that relationship defined that helps us establish households. Um, so Jennifer, age 33, is the spouse of Fernando, age 28. And Jennifer is the parent of Jesse, age six. And then we do for Fernando, age 28, is the parent of Jesse. And by doing this, it creates the reciprocal, the system will that Jesse is the child of both Fernando and the child of uh, Jennifer, and that Fernando is the spouse of Jennifer. Who is the primary caretaker for Jesse? So later on, we'll be adding income for Jennifer. She'll be the, the pro primary provider right now. So we're going to put that Fernando is the primary caretaker for the child in the home. Uh, there's no absent parents to add. Both are here. OK, and. The, the Medicaid program is built around the Affordable Care Act. It really focuses on a tax filing household, or if the household does not file taxes, then it uses relationships. Um, but we're going to say, well, this household files taxes, Jennifer and Fernando. And because they're married, it's going to ask, do they plan to file jointly? We'll say yes. And then Jesse, the child, who who is uh, who do they show as a t tax dependent for? It's someone inside the household, and that would be Jennifer, since she's the main person applying. Hey Wes, so I'll just jump in real quickly, mm -hmm. and just like um, Wes mentioned. If they don't file taxes, that's okay. We can still determine Medicaid eligibility. There's just a different method that is used to determine that eligibility. And just to touch on too, with Jennifer making this application prior to her changing her name legally, at the point that she does change her name, then she can easily just reach out to 
her local agency and report that she has changed her name legally. Um, it's very important to use what is legally on the social security card or any immigration document. Just like Wes said, for our electronic methods of verifying information that's available these days that will help ensure um, a match. Okay, so where do you live? Uh, there's a few questions on this. If they've entered an address, we show that address and then we ask the question, does everyone in the household live with Jennifer at the address above? We can say yes. Are all residents? Uh, yes. Is anybody temporarily absent? We'll say no. And again, if we have questions on that, what does the temporarily absent mean? It's basically, let's say I'm gone for a short period of time, like a short-term job, short-term military deployment, I'm at school, um, they're still, they can still be considered North Carolina residents, they're just temporarily absent for a short time. And then is everyone a US citizen? We will say no. Um, Fernando is not a US citizen. And then we can it asks, well, what is his status? Um, if he doesn't have, if he's not a US citizen, does he have el eligible immigration status? And they can either say, I prefer not to say, or yes. And then we would select what that status would be, if it's any of these. For our, ours, it's going to be none of these. Um, and he has documentation on a I-94 in an unexpired foreign passport. Um, did he meet any of these statuses when he entered? No. And he recently entered, was uh, just like a year and a half ago. And he's not sponsoring anybody. Then it gets into the five-year bar. This is basically, if they have certain eligible immigration status, they can receive, they can be eligible and entitled to benefits uh, right off without waiting for five years, such as an asylee or a refugee are good examples. For our situation, we didn't select any of those. Or if they lived in the US before this date, we're gonna say no. Um, also, if they are a vet or mili uh, have military status or their spouse or they're the child of such, then we would ask those questions. Ours are gonna say no. But those are the ways to pass that five-year bar um, rule. Okay, wants to know about the supporting document, that I-94 uh, that we entered. So we'll put in the I-94 number, um, the passport number, country of issuance. We're going to say it's uh, uh, Dominican Republic. Um, we would enter a visa number if we had one if there's an expiration date, and if his name is different, then we can select that here. Uh, we're gonna say that is the same, so it's, there's no difference. And now we get to the household summary. And this is the, the kind of the demographic information that we've entered so far on the household. And it's important that we look at this information and review it. Um, check all the information twice, make sure we don't have any misspelled names, transposed numbers or wrong date of birth or social security number. I can come view it. If I see that something wrong, oh, let's say Jesse, oh, his date of birth, I have that wrong. I can hit change. It'll take me back to that page. I can update it and let's say it's supposed to be the 11th, not the 1st. Um, hit next and finish out the other information on Jesse. And then it takes me back to the summary. And I can see that now that date of birth has been updated. If I need to add another person, I can do that here or any other details. But again, take a second look because it's important. We try to use this information to check our electronic sources. And if something's wrong, but we don't have that correct information, we're not able to verify the details and then it stops the flow of the application and requires the caseworker to make a call to them, to the household, to get documentation to verify the information. We're going to say everything here looks good. 
Wes, I'm just going to jump in. They, yep. The caseworker would also send something to you in writing, a, a formal request for any information that may be, be missing and needed for the application. Great. Uh, we're now on the section about income and money. Um, and does anybody receive income? Um, here below uh, some of the questions, we have what we call hint text. It kind of just gives more details about that, what that might be so they can quickly see, oh yeah, I do have a job. Uh, so yes, um, Jennifer is our member. Again, we have the ages here so we can distinguish the different people with the same name. So there's uh, income being received, but not any educational scholarships. So we'll say no. And again, this income is based upon income that you would report on your tax form. Uh, so when you get in here and you see the type of income that there is, it's all based upon what you would enter on a 1040. Uh, we're going to say she has a job. Uh, she works at Belk. Um, she works 35 hours a week. And how much does she make before taxes? So her gross income, uh, we're going to say she makes $2,500 and it's paid monthly. And she started that job a, a couple of years back. It has not ended. And then the question, does she have any more income? So if she had a second job, uh, maybe part-time as well, you could say, oh, yes. And it would save this data. Refresh the screen to enter more de the other job details for Jennifer. We're going to say we don't have any more, so we are done. And then we get into deductions. Again, these are deductions that you can claim on your 1040 tax return. Here's, again, some high level things, what they might be. Student loan interest, health savings account. We're going to say yes. And that Jennifer does, we're going to say she has a student loan, right? And this deduction, uh, here's all the different deductions that can be allowed. Um, you know, it could be 401k, can be a health savings account. We're going to say this one is um, uh, the student loan interest. So it's not the full student loan, right? So if my, my student loan is $250 a month, well, how much of that is interest that I pay? We're going to say it's $25 a month. I've been paying on it for a few years. Uh, it hasn't ended, ended, and I pay this monthly. And again, do I have any more deductions? If there were more that were in that list that I saw previously, I could say yes. We're just going to add this one. Okay, we get to our next section, additional household information. And this is where we need to know details basically about everybody in the household uh, around these areas. And again, these are not required fields, um, but it's a reminder we encourage to provide the answers on all of these questions if possible. And non-answer, meaning they just skip over it. Um, could mean that the caseworker has to follow up with them after they submit the application as they it could not determine the, the impact to eligibility. Um, for our situation, we're just going to say no on everything. But like if, uh, you know, Jennifer was pregnant, we could indicate that here and we would get those pregnancy details. Uh, we're going to say no. And we'll just go through. All of these, um, if they have outside health insurance. Incarcerated Indian Health Services. I think, Liz, you talked on that. Yeah, just a reminder, that's that's very important to note if they are eligible for Indian Health Services. That goes along with that tribal, federally recognized tribal membership. Great. And then also if they wanted to select a primary care provider, doctor, or an NC managed care plan, they could do that here as well. We're going to say no. Um, we don't need to go through that process here. Liz, did you want to add to that? Yeah, thanks. And I just want to clarify too, someone could be eligible for Indian Health Services, but not a 
member of a federally recognized tribe, but there's a connection to that federally recognized tribe. But with the primary care provider or selecting a managed care health plan, this is optional, as Wes said, and it's his preference that they can go ahead and enter in if they've already established a relationship with their primary care provider. Um, they can put that name in there. We can uh, hope to, we can, it's, again, it's a preference. We can hope, try to make sure that that gets who you get assigned to. Um, not everyone's going to be managed care. We do anticipate the majority of those that will be eligible for the MAGI adult group, the Medicaid expansion group will be enrolled in the standard plan. And so they can put a preference for one of the health plans. If they have done some research, if they're aware of the plans and they have one specifically that they would like, they can put a preference in there. So if they are required to enroll with the health plan, that preference is in there. And um, with, through an algorithm, they could be enrolled with that health plan. But just to keep in mind, that we can, um, they can change who their plans within 90 days. They can change their primary care provider. The enrollment broker, the North Carolina Medicaid enrollment broker is a source that they can go online to look um, and check about plans and their providers to see if their provider is participating with a particular plan or all of the plans. So that information is helpful. There's ways to go and search for that. Um, but this is a preference. It's not required to be entered, but it's information that could be used for that enrollment process. Great. Thanks, Liz. Okay, um, now we get into prior medical expenses. Um, this is where, like, if I'm applying today on the 19th of September and I'm determined eligible for Medicaid, I get, I'm determined eligible from the first of the month forward. Now, if I had, for whatever reason, had a medical expense in one of the prior three months, for us it would be June, July, or August, that I didn't have insurance for or was not covered, I can indicate that here. And if I need eligibility for either a single month or the three months, I, I can have those services covered or uh, paid for. For our situation, we're going to say we don't have any prior medical bills in the last three months that we need covered. So now we're on the last review and submit the, a summary again. This has the same summary we saw before on the demographics, but now also includes all the information we added for the income. Uh, again, we can come here and we can make a change if that was wrong and I need to change it to uh, $2,600. We can make that change here, hit next. And then again, that change will take place and show on the summary uh, with that change that we just did or add income. Again, just re-verify the information, double check the names, double check the dates of birth, uh, social security numbers and such. And at this point, once it's been verified, down at the bottom, there's the next. Uh, we get into the final steps that basically says, hey, we may need to verify some of your information if we're not able to do it electronically. Um, here's some things we may need to verify. Um, but we'll go ahead and pass these by. There's a North Carolina residency declaration where they can indicate if they are able or not able to provide one of these documents. Um, if they're able to provide it, uh, then they would just say, yes, I am able to provide these. And now we get to the sign and submit. Uh, where they basically are saying that they've filled out an electronic application, that they're agreeing to comply with like medical support of an absent parent if there is one, that they've given true information, um, that they're electronically signing this, and under penalty of perjury, the information they've given is accurate to the best of their knowledge. Um, they would then enter their name here, and just like a written signature, this is legally binding. It's their electronic signature. Uh, they would hit submit. And then we get the confirmation. Your application has been submitted. Uh, next steps. Um, this is great. It's showing. So 
Uh, this is something that's going to be coming out. This is a test environment, right? So things are changing all the time. Uh, but this is where they now can say, oh, I need to verify some things. Well, I can add that to my application. So I can go here um, and I can say, well, let me add my driver's license, select it. And my driver's license is add there. I can add more files if I need to. Let's just pick another one. And those are all there. And then I can submit those files with my application, right? So submit and close. And then those, along with my application, those documents I added, whether it was uh, my ID, my pay stubs, will go along with that application to the caseworker. They get the application. They get a task. They also get those documents you submitted. So that was great to see that because that wasn't there last week. Um, again, it's new stuff that will be coming out in live ePass towards the end of the year. Okay. From here, we kind of wanted to go over. Uh, now we've submitted the application. I guess let me go here. I can go to my applications and I can see that I submitted this one today. September 19th, it's pending. This is the reference number. So if I needed to contact the county office, I can give that reference number to them. They can use it to look it up as well as my name and social security number and other identifying information. And with that, we're going to transition over to um, the other features, what we call um, the Enhancer ePass account that we talked about. The, receive e-notices. So I'm going to log into a different area here. It'll just take a minute. And as I'm doing that, um, there's a process they have to go through um, to enhance their e-pass account. We created an account um, using an NCID. We logged in, but now we have to do extra steps to en enhance that account, basically to say that Wes, who he says he is in ePass, is the same Wes that we had in NC Fast. Once we that application is registered and I'm over there, we need to bridge the two and say Wes in ePass is the same Wes in NC Fast, which is the case management system. So maybe take a minute while that's doing that. Okay, let me log in. So this one will look a little bit different um, than the other one. Uh, when you look at the dashboard here, everything's kind of locked down. It's got um, dashed borders with a padlock. There's a big button that says, hey, you need to enhance your account. You only have a uh, dashboard and your applications up here. When I come into the other one, when I've logged in to an enhanced account, once it loads here, let me bring up one thing while it's doing that. If it's loaded yet. Okay, so now my enhanced account, the dashboard, uh, looks a bit a little bit different. It doesn't have the big blue banner. And as I look at these cards with specific actions, um, they're no longer are dashed and there's no longer a lock on them because they are now unlocked features. I can still apply. Uh, but what we've also done is if you've submitted your application or a reported change and there's information needed for the caseworker to process, we show that, like, hey, you have documents that are needed to process your application or case. So I can hit continue, or I can say, send us your documents. That's the same thing. I click here, and I can see, and again, this isn't the same names that we had for Fernando and Jesse and Jennifer. It's a different case. But I need to verify citizenship for medical assistance. I need to verify it for Bo, because he says he's a US citizen. I need to verify income for Billy that he receives $200 weekly at his job. 
uh, residency. So much like we did at the end of the application, I can go and upload a document. Again, here's like the format that it supports. I can add file. I can add that driver's license. Hit open. I can see that it's here in queue. I hit save. Now it's going through like a process to make sure it doesn't have a virus on it. And it's now save and done. And now we can see that it's ready to submit. And I have a button that allows me to submit those documents. If I need to add other ones, let's say I need to add for income. So let's just add a file here. And I don't know exactly what I have in here. Let's just say I'm adding this one. I say I need to add like three pay stubs for each month. And I'm going to choose a separate um, pay stub file, one for June, one for July, one for August. I add those here. I can keep adding more files that are relevant to this income for Billy at $200 weekly. Hit save and then save and done. And then they're also showing here. Now I'm ready to submit my documents or income. And I can continue doing that process, adding those documents rather than waiting for the worker to get back to me through mail and say, hey, we need this information. And then I have to send it in the mail. That's probably five days each way. I've just done it in a matter of five minutes. When I hit submit, just like we did on the application, these documents now go over to the caseworker instantaneously. They get a task. They can view them and say, yes, this is exactly what I needed and continue processing the application or the change. Um, so this, we also give them a notice if they've uploaded documents and haven't submitted them, then they would want to go back and hit submit because these are sitting here. That's just another reminder. Uh, but if we go back, e-notices, again, that's where they can view any electronic notice that they, they've signed up. They can view those rather than get them in the mail. Again, another five days to receive it. It's there instantaneously overnight. They would receive that notice. Um, they can report a change. So this, this already has an active medical assistance case on it. If they wanted to report a change, they can click here. Um, they're not receiving food nutrition services, so they can't report a change for that, but they are receiving medical. So they'll report a change for medical assistance. Hit this button, and it kind of looks like that same application we went through. It has the same look and feel. Um, they'll hit next, and it gives them that same type of summary that we just saw. They can come here and say, oh, yeah, something did change. Um, uh, you know, I need to add um, income. I got a new job, so I'm going to add income for Billy. Again, it's a job, and it's kind of the same steps we just went through on our other person. Let's say he works for 20 hours. It's uh, 250 a week, and uh, he's paid weekly. He started working there, let's just say, the beginning of this month and hit next. And again, now I have the income summary. I hit next and then I go back to my full summary. I can see that my income is there. I can hit, once I've done, hit continue. And then it goes through that same process of signing it, signing it, um, the final steps, sign and submit uh, will come up and then the same process, you've submitted your change. I'm going to go ahead and delete this one because I really uh, need to leverage it for other times. Um, we'll go back to my account and dashboard. And again, that's going to be coming out for FNS and SNAP uh, near the end of the year. Uh, secure messages, this is where we talked about if they signed up for secure messages. Um, they can receive that text that, hey, well, for, first off, that they've signed up and then the new message is there. Uh, they can go here and they can say, oh, I do have a new message to view. I can click it. I can see here's one that was already sent to me. I've already read it. Here's my new one. If I click it, then the full message comes up. 
Um, you know, please send in information for, uh, in a form of identification for Bobby, student ID, birth certificate, driver's license, clothes. Uh, this one that we just got new, I can see how they need the pay stubs for July and August. Hit close. The new now goes away uh, because I've taken the action. I've understood what I need to do, but I always can go back and review that again if I need to. It just doesn't show as anything outstanding anymore. Um, let's see here. They can update their account settings. This is where if they need to change their phone number or email for logging in, they can do that here. Uh, subscribe or unsubscribe to those secure messages or update the uh, text, the mobile number where those go to. Um, one other thing um, to cover here, we showed how to upload documents on the desktop um, on a mobile device, it'll recognize that it's a mobile browser. So when they bring it up and they add the document, not only will it give the option to choose a file, like we did on that file picker with the desktop, but they can also access the photo library or just take a photo. Oh, there's my photo. Let me just take a picture, snap it. It'll show there. I can add that file and I'm done. So mobile friendly for that as well. Um, now, the question kind of remains is, well, those are the hands, enhanced in features, but how did I turn them on? So with that, um, there's another demo to view here, another recording. Um, within the ePass application, if they meet certain conditions, after they've added in the first person, let's say they're applying for Jennifer, they've added in Jennifer's details, if certain conditions are met, then we'll ask, well, does Jennifer, do you want to enhance your account and turn on these features? Um, what that requires is um, that we submit their information to Experian, which is one of the three main credit bureaus. And then they get asked a series of questions regarding their credit history. So if you've ever bought something on credit, a house, a car, you've taken out a student loan, you filled in certain details about your age, your address. It knows the house you're buying, like where it's at, number of bedrooms. It knows the type of car you're buying, whether it's a Toyota, a Honda, or a Ford. And so it'll ask you those type of questions. And so we're just going to quickly kind of view this in a video. Um, so again, um, if we meet those features, let me go back 10 seconds here. Hopefully it doesn't time out. Okay, so here, once I've entered in the information again, uh, and I meet the qualifications such as entering a, an address, I've entered an SSN, um, I have credit hit, or I'm at least age 18 or older, um, it'll then ask me if I want to um, enhance my account. So here I'm going to enter an SSN in. And there it was like, hey, do you want to enhance your account? Here's the features. We're going to go to Experian. And you agree to go through that process. They can hit yes or no. If no, they just skip and they start adding the second or third household member, right? So we're going to go ahead and hit yes. Okay, so then it's going to interface again with Experian, bring back pertinent questions that only they should know, such as, hey, you bought a car, what type of car was it? These are very basic in nature, but they would be like more detailed. Again, this is kind of just test data. Um, they would enter that, yeah, yeah, it was the Ford that I bought. And select that. At any point, they can jump out and skip if they get caught on this. If they hit skip, they would go to enter the second household member. And this will ask them like three to four of these uh, credit style questions. What is the year of the vehicle? Uh, they, you know, because it was bought on credit. So it knows that. And then this one has a last question of, you know, what is the name of the city where you previously lived? This one would be something different, like, you know, what is the address 
which of these addresses have you lived at? Uh, once they've entered the information in, they've entered it correctly, then it'll tell them that they've answered the security questions correctly and we need to send them a code. So to enhance their account, they also need a mobile phone number to send a text message or an email to send a, a message to with a six digit code to know that we have the right information. Um, and we're verifying that because they need that phone number or email address to log in again um, to authenticate when they're logged into ePass because it requires what we call two-factor authentication, not only the username and password, but also another device that says that this is them and they have that device in their hand and they're receiving a code to that device, whether it is a uh, text to their mobile number or a um, code, uh, an email address to their, an email to their email address. Okay, so they're saying they want to receive it uh, via text message. Here's the phone number. And then they would go ahead and enter the code that they received. It says here it went to this phone number, enter the code. So enter their code correctly. It'll tell them that. Now they have an enhanced account. And we ask them, well, do you want to set up a secondary method? You have one method for that, which is your text message. But let's say your phone is, uh, you lost service, it's dead, the battery's dead, or it's been disconnected. You now have a secondary method to log in, which would, you know, for this one, we're going to do email and enter the email address. And then we would get the code also to that email address and enter the code in that we received. And then once we've done it, it's complete. Uh, and then they successively have enhanced their account and they are done at this point. Uh, the next page would be to go to your household and add the other household members in once they've done that. Uh, so with that, I think we've covered all the information uh, as far as showing the ePass, you know, landing page, uh, the functionality there, submitting an application, and then the enhanced functionality of uploading documents, um, getting secure messages, um, reporting a change, uh, and then also the process to actually enhance the account by going through that um, remote identity proofing process. And with that, Melanie, I'll turn the time uh, back over to you. All right. Thank you, Wes and Liz. Um, all right. So we got uh, a lot of questions in the Q&A. So thank you all for submitting your questions. Um, there are definitely some that we will um, we'll have to follow up on to uh, make sure we have the right answers for you. And as I mentioned at the top of the webinar today, we will um, make sure that you all have access to the questions and answers um, on our website, and we will send that information out to you when it is ready. Um, there are some questions that were submitted uh, that don't have answers that we can uh, cover now. Um, and then maybe what we'll try to do is give folks an opportunity to raise your hand if you would like to ask a question out loud. But first, I will go ahead and review a couple of questions that came in through the question and answer pod. So one of these questions is, what is the best option for consumers who do not have a phone address or email to enroll in Medicaid? Will DSS assist consumers in getting these items to erase the barrier from obtaining Medicaid? And we did have some other questions that were similar to this. Um, Liz, do you want to address this? Sure, thank you. That's a great question. And so you don't have to have an email address to apply for Medicaid. You do not have to have 
a permanent address uh, to apply for Medicaid or receive Medicaid. We do have a lot of beneficiaries who may be unhoused and do not have a permanent address. Many times they use that uh, the DSS as their address and they come by frequently to check any mail or they may have use address for someone else just for their mail to go to. Um, and we have consumers, uh, beneficiaries that do not have telephones. So that should not be a barrier. That may be a barrier to possibly submitting electronically unless they can come through you um, the uh, uh, to help them assist in completing a paper application and mailing it in. They can also go to the DSS. So there's all kinds of different ways. But no, those should not be a barrier to applying for Medicaid or even receiving Medicaid benefits. And the DSS will do as much to assist the beneficiary in obtaining any verifications and information that are needed to process their application if they need assistance. So I hope that answers the question. All right. Did, did I leave anything out, Melanie? No, I don't think so. I think that covers it. Thank you. All right. Um, the next question, can a representative create an NCID account as well as the individuals that they are assisting? Can the representative use their NCID account for multiple applications? I can kind of take that one on. That's where um, they would need to uh, register a business NCID. If you are submitting uh, multiple, if you're assisting multiple households and submitting multiple applications, um, you need to create a business NCID within uh, the NCID account creation. And then you need to have that account. You need to contact the county office, um, the county uh, DSS office and have your NCID uh, provisioned in our case management system that shows that you are submitting um, multiple applications on behalf of multiple individuals, you are not an authorized rep, you're not acting legally for them, but you're helping them in the application process. And so that's the process that would need to occur. The uh, county DSS offices have a desk guide on how to do that provision in EPAS if you do call them. Um, not all of them are aware, probably not every caseworker, um, but that's where we can give them some feedback and help them remind them of that desk guide. Great, great. Thank you, Wes. All right, let's see. Um, if someone in your household is incarcerated, are they considered temporarily living outside the home? I know earlier in the application you covered some scenarios that would consider that would be considered a temporary absence. Um, I guess I can sort of take this a little bit here. Um, yes, I think we would need to know about that that household member. If they're temporarily absent, it could be a short incarceration. Um, and so it may or may be close to the end of the incarceration. So there are times when someone could potentially be could be eligible while they're temporarily incarcerated, or we would need to know about that person if you're not applying for that person that of their their temporary absence. And just additionally on that on that page that had all the questions about pregnancy, that had the managed care questions, there was a question: Is anybody incarcerated? So you would have needed to add them in. Uh, you can put them as temporarily absent if need be. Uh, but I think that temporary absent is of the state, right? Maybe they're incarcerated in Virginia. I don't know. But then you would add in those incarceration details for that. And again, the system using information that we receive from data sources, such as Department of Corrections, uh, that would help guide us on their eligibility or not. All right. Thank you.
Okay, a follow-up question. Um, do applicants receive notifications by email or text with documents needed for verification? Would this just be if they have signed up for those alerts? So even if they sign up and re if they receive e-notices, which is an electronic version, uh, then that's the way the information is going to come to them. Instead of the post office delivering it in their mailbox, if they sign up for e-notices, that notice of additional verifications needed is going to come. Uh, they're going to receive a text or email that says, hey, you have uh, a notice to go view go log in, they would view it, they click it, it looks exactly the same, it's a PDF, and it looks exactly the same as if it was printed out and it came from their mailbox. The, the secure messages, which is just a kind of a, hey, I also need this information, that still has to be followed up by a notice sent by the caseworker, a request for information uh, that would come either via the Postal Service or that electronic notice to their e-pass inbox. So the secure messages as the FYI, hey, I really need these pay stubs, is not, they still have to send the, uh, the, um, the legal notice in the mail or electronically if they've subscribed to e-notices. All right, thank you. All right, so we do have um, we have a couple more questions we can review in the chat, but if you are unable to submit a question in the Q&A, um, feel free to raise your hand and I believe that I can try to, to unmute you and allow you to come on camera if you would like. All right, so. Um, will the enrollment brokers have access to e-pass? No, the enrollment broker does not have access to e-pass. Or I guess, sorry, I'm, I may not be completely understanding the question. So anyone can access the e-pass site, right? However, um, an enrollment broker would not have access to like an application that was submitted on ePass. Um, if you were to, if if an applicant were to contact the enrollment broker for information about managed care or a health plan, um, the enrollment broker would not be able to, for example, look up your information um, using ePass. And I apologize if I misunderstood the question. All right. Uh, regarding names, whether it is first name or last name, no special characters or space or spaces. The only distinction between two words in a name is the capitalization. Am I correct? This was going to the two surnames for the last name. That is correct. It would be like we said, Garcia Lopez capital G for Garcia, capital L for Lopez, no space, no special character, no hyphen, no exclamation point. All right, thank you. Okay, I received a message that someone has their hand up, but I cannot see it on my end. Oh, wait, here we go. Okay, Betty Taylor. I am going to, Betty, you should be unmuted if you would like to ask your question. I'm sorry, it must have accidentally hit it. I, oh. did, not, I did not have a question. Thank okay. you. Well, it's good to know that it works at least. <laughs> All right. Oh, I see one more. Uh, one more hand up. So, Kevin, if you would like to go ahead and ask your question. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me? We can. 
Okay. Um, my question is regarding um, the NCID business account. Can you please clarify that a little bit? Um, and I guess I'm wondering if it applies to my, um, I guess my clinic. We're a free clinic in Brunswick County and we're just, uh, if we're applying on behalf, well, helping others apply, do we need to sign up for an NCID business account? Yeah, I think um, the whole account to create, I think that's a whole nother subject that we could probably spend another hour on. But briefly, what we want to have happen if for your organization, it's best if you can help them create their own NCID, right? If they have their own NCID, then they can do those other features we saw at the end which is manage their case when they have an enhanced account. They can do more than submit an application. They can do those reported changes. If everything's tied to your NCID, Kevin, then they cannot do that. So the way I would distinguish it is you should still have your own business NCID. You would create that. And then depending on who you are sitting with and assisting, you would make the decision. Am I going to help Wes? create his own NCID, he has an email, and he is somewhat tech savvy, he has a mobile phone, he uses banking apps. Let's have him manage his case, right? Whereas if I'm going to sit and assist with Susie, and let's say Susie is 85, and she's probably maybe I'm not saying age is the only deterrent, but maybe she just say she just needs to have an application submitted and she's not going to manage the case. That's where you can log in with yours and you're submitting those multiple applications for multiple households. And then you can see the status. Oh, I submitted it. Why is it being held up? Um, let me call the caseworker and ask a couple questions. Why is this still pending? Whereas if I created my NCID and my own case, then I would be the one to call up and say, hey, I submitted this, it's still pending. Help me move forward. I hope that helps answer your question, uh, Kevin, with the short couple minute answer for something that's probably like an hour long discussion. Uh, and I, I, this is Liz, I just would like to add in order for, Anyone to discuss um, someone else's Medicaid case with you, Kevin, our caseworker, you would need to be designated as an authorized representative for that individual. Okay, got it. Thank you so much for the clarification. So uh, I guess I have a follow-up question with the NCID business account. So in that situation, um, would it be viable for an NCID business account for an individual who does not have an email address? So that goes back to like if if you're signing in, Kevin, you have an email address because you created your business NCID. You're assisting somebody that doesn't have an email address, nor do they want to create one, nor do they want to manage their ePass a case, their ePass case online, that's where you can just log in as yourself, right? Have your own business and CID, log in the ePass, and then assist them in submitting that application. Okay, got it, thank you. Uh, apologies, I did not realize I was on mute. Um, so I know that we still have some unanswered questions, um, but we are already past our end time for our webinar today. Um, if you can see on the slide, there is an email address listed here. I will leave this up for a few minutes um, so you can jot it down if you would like. Uh, if you have additional questions that you were not able to submit today or you think of something later that you would like to ask uh, pertaining to today's webinar, um, feel free to email your question to this email address here on the screen. It is medicaid.ncengagement at dhhs.nc.gov. 
And we really appreciate you all being here with us this afternoon. Thank you, Wes. Thank you, Liz. Thank you to our interpreters today. We really appreciate you. Um, and we hope you all have a great evening. Thanks, everyone.